Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's nice to be here. I have to tell you just quickly, my very first job when I was 14 years old was at the library in Scarborough, the Cedar Bray Library, where I was a page. You don't want to tell people when you're a teenager, I'm a page at the library, or they say, are you high? <laughs> anyway, I'm very happy tonight to introduce Kevin. Uh, Kevin, I met, I guess, almost five years ago when he came to the very first audition we held for Dragons. You know, pitchers don't only audition to be on the show. The Dragons had to audition to win their chairs. And I don't think he'd been in the chair more than five minutes. Then we were all sort of looking around at each other thinking we have found our first dragon. Because he was great. He was incisive and intelligent and entertaining and harsh from day one. We did not coach him to be like that. That is Kevin. <laughs> If you've watched the show, you probably know a lot about Kevin's uh, accomplishments in the business world. It's pretty incredible. Um, from the book, of course, you would learn exactly how he maneuvered his way from a very small startup. He had to even get a $10,000 loan from his mother at one point into doing a $4.2 billion deal with Mattel. He's absolutely relentless in terms of his focus and achieving goals. It's, it's a great read, I have to say. Um, um, you may also know that Kevin has no less than four television shows. Of course, Dragon's Den, plus the American version, which is Shark Tank, plus he does The Daily Show uh, on the news network with Amanda Lang, the Lang and O'Leary Exchange, every day. And he has a new show coming out in January. It's called Redemption, Inc. And it's Kevin working with ex-cons teaching them how to make money the legal way. <laughs> and from what he's told me so far, I think it's gonna be absolutely fascinating. But besides all these things in business and television, you know, now he's an author. Here he is, he's written a book, and it's not his only creative pursuit, I have to tell you. If you've watched the show, you may also know Kevin is very musical. He loves music. He once told me actually on Lang and O'Leary that the book that influenced them, him the most was John Lennon's book. He loves music. He plays the guitar himself extremely well. He made documentaries. He's got all sorts of talents, but I shouldn't really go on and tell you how great he is because I'm sure he'd rather tell you that himself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin O'Leary. Thank you, Diane, for those kind words. And I've been working with Diane a long time. She's sort of the she-wolf in the dragon's den. That's the way I look at it. So let me tell you what I'd like to do tonight. Uh, let's just start with sort of, um, let's have fun in events like this. We're all out here to enjoy ourselves. So I'm going to show you some interesting attributes of television. People ask me all the time, Diane just listed the shows I'm working on. Why would an investor like me do television in the first place? Am I a narcissist? Do I like seeing myself on TV every night? Is there a reason? And I think I'm going to give you a, a pretty persuasive argument as to why investing, which is a science, black and white, there's no gray in money. You either make money or you lose money. That's the key to money. But television is chaos. It's the arts. It's a lot of fun to work on it. It changes every day. But there are some links between the two that are very, very interesting. So. Let's talk a little bit about um, what happens here in, in terms of this book first. I'm going to show you the video we shot right here money, you gotta take the heat. this library. You guys are a stain on the face of capitalism. I'm out. It was a dark and stormy night. Competitors lurked everywhere, and I had to take them out. Mm, too soft. Competitors were everywhere, and I had to crush them like the cockroaches they were. Then I had to obliterate them, I had to annihilate them. I had to pour boiling oil over them. I had to kill them all. <laughs> Now that's more like it. Mm. I'm writing this book about money and how I turned a few thousand dollars into a billion dollar empire. And now you can too. I'll also reveal my softer side. 
scratch that. I'm not going to do that. Where was I? Mm. Buy my book. No, buy lots of my book. Buy some for your friends, your mother, your father, your cat, and even your dog. Why? Because it's about the money. And ain't that the cold, hard truth? Wait, there's more. Mm. Beautiful. <laughs> I love that. That was produced by Mike Armitage, one of the producers that works on Dragon's Den. He had a great idea for it, and I've really enjoyed working with him. It was a lot of fun. Shot in here in the Sherlock Holmes or Arthur Conan Doyle Library, which is only open rarely. Beautiful, beautiful room. If you ever get a chance to see it, please look at it. Some of you may know this woman, Amanda Lang. She's the most attractive communist on TV. <laughs> I work with her every day, and I have for the last 11 years. Um, she's my TV wife, basically. You know, and, and, and the way I look at it is, thank goodness I'm here, because if she was left alone on the CBC with that platform and her left-wing views, she could do damage to this country. <laughs> but this is a great example of how television and investing come together. So let me ask a question. What does every politician, every author, every CEO, every hedge fund manager, every economist, every musician, everybody wants to be on television? And where do they come? They come to the Langle Area Exchange because luckily, after all these years, we own that hour. We have the biggest numbers at that time in Canada on the network. So let me tell you a little story about TV you may find interesting. Back in the 60s, and some of you are old enough, and you're old as I am, to remember Johnny Carson. So Johnny Carson had 42 million people watching him. That'll never happen again in television because we have so many cable channels now that bifurcate the audience, but there was only three big networks back then. 42 million people watched Johnny Carson. And everybody wondered why he did such a fantastic job interviewing everybody. How did he do it? He used to go into the green room before the show started, and he made this a policy, and go talk to his guests just briefly. And what he'd say to them was, listen, I know you're nervous. You're about to go in front of 42 million people. But let's just have a conversation, you and I. And I guarantee you with certainty that whatever we talk about will never, ever, ever go on the air. It's off the record. People trusted him, even people he didn't know. This policy became legendary. Decades later, when Ted Turner started CNN, same policy was put in place. Whatever's discussed in the green room is off the record. So think about the green room at Langolier Exchange. Now everywhere in television, people understand that what you have and what you discuss in the green room is off the record unless you make a specific point to say that it won't be. So if Flaherty comes to Langolier Exchange, or the CEO of Bell or TELUS, or the head of the teacher's pension fund, I get him for 18 minutes for free right in front of me, every day. Five guests a day, five days a week, 52 weeks a year. Can you imagine the information? That's why I do it. Some of you are familiar uh, with this show. This is a cultural phenomenon. Why does Dragon's Den appeal to so many people? Why is it that a nine-year-old girl and a nine-year-old man watch this show? We've had as many, and I'll, let me give you the numbers just to give you an idea. The news on the CBC on a good night gets 800,000 people watching it. A hockey game in the off season between two original six teams, 1.2 million people watch. That's a lot of people on television watching. A good night on Dragon's Den, two million. How is it and why? The network wants to know, the competitors want to know, the advertisers want to know why. Well, I have a thesis, I have a theory. What are you watching when you watch Dragon's Den? I think you're watching the pursuit of freedom. What is it to be rich? It's freedom. What's the purpose of money? To be free. Even a nine-year-old girl understands that. The pursuit of wealth is the most noble enterprise on earth. 
not because of money, because of freedom. Now, not all these ideas are going to work, but somebody is going to strike it rich and be free. That's why it's so visceral. That's why it's so powerful. That's why it works. Now, you know, when we make shows like this, and Diane can attest to it, we work for 11 hours to make one hour of TV. That means 10 hours of tape you never see. It's inappropriate. Something crazy happened. It's not family content, whatever. But at the end of a shooting schedule, which is about 21 days, we, the cast, and the crew, about 100 of them, get together for a party. Jim Trilliving, the Boston pizza guy, he provides the pizza. We buy a lot of beer. We drink the beer, we eat the pizza, and then we watch what's called the outtake reel. The editors, while they're watching the show being taped, take from the line cut, as it's called, little snippets of really hilarious stuff that you're never going to see. Stuff that's inappropriate for even YouTube. Can't leave the CBC building. So this year when I saw the outtake reel, I said to the editors, that is fantastic. Can I get a copy of that? He said, you know, Kevin, I can't do that. I have to destroy this thing after this because it's just not appropriate to leave the CBC. So I stole it. <laughs> it's on my Mac, and we're going to see it in just a moment. I think you're going to really enjoy this. This is five minutes of little pieces, and you'll, you'll meet the new dragon as well. I think you might find it funny. From the success in Canada of Dragon's Den came Shark Tank, which is being done by Mark Burnett. I work on that as well with American sharks, which are essentially American dragons. And we work together on a show that's obviously made for the American audience. It's different, but in some ways it's the same. Entrepreneurs are the same in both places. And this idea of being able to meet people is a constant. You know, I got a phone call from a Dancing with the Stars. And they said, Kevin, will you come down to Dancing with the Stars? I said, no, not going to do that. And they said, yeah, you're going to do it. We want you to sit in the front row, and when the camera zooms in on you, you shout out, watch Shark Tank at 9 o'clock, right after Dancing with the Stars. I said, why, why would I do that? It's going to take me six hours to get to Los Angeles. I'm going to work for 10 seconds and come back. They said, no, you're going to do it. I said, don't think so. And they told me, and maybe you know this, Steve Wozniak is a recluse. He's the other side of Steve Jobs who created Apple. Everybody knows Steve will not ever do an interview. And if you're an investor, he's legendary. He still owns his 15 cent Apple stock. It trades at $400 a share now. Guess what? He loves Dancing with the Stars. He was on Dancing with the Stars and he sucked. The guy weighs about, th weighs about 300 pounds. He can't dance. So he lost right away, but he goes to every taping of Dancing with the Stars, and there's an empty seat beside him, and they want to entice somebody to come down. They say, you can sit beside Wozniak and take him out for dinner after the show. Now, I have always wanted to meet him because I built my company on the back of the Apple computer. So here I am with Damon John, the shark, in the front row of Dancing with the Stars, and, and here I am afterwards with Steve Wozniak. I would have never met this guy without television, ever. And I said to him, hey, you know, Woz, I don't invest in Apple stock because it doesn't pay a dividend. And he said, yeah, yeah, I hate that. So I buy all the component manufacturers in Asia that make all the parts for us that do pay a dividend. I said, hey, can you email me that list? He said, sure. <laughs> now, I own them and so do the guys who invest in O'Leary funds. I would have never known that had I not met this guy. So the value of television goes on. And for my son, this is Gonzo. Loves Gonzo. What's Gonzo doing at Dancing with the Stars? He knows that 21 million people watch Dancing with the Stars, and he's promoting his new Muppet movie. So let's have a look at this year's outtake reel of Dragon's Den. These, this is the new cast. Bruce Croxton is our new dragon. He's the guy that founded Lava Life. We call him Dr. Love. All right? Enjoy this. Five, four, three, two, one, bring them out. Hello, dragons. Holy crap. Well, Does it turns... taste like crap? Ooh. You feel a lot of saliva. Oh, holy. <laughs> oh. And even distribution. Whoa. Love it. The actual juice um, in their restaurant. Still um, smells bad, huh? <laughs> I don't you know, know what, I'm still I'm getting the, the, the older lawnmower in here. My butt, my butt, looking at me. Big butt, little butt, wiggly butt, and jiggly butt. 
I want to swim through the sea with Arlene. <laughs> I want to frolic in the forest with Kevin. Big butts, little butts, wiggly butts, and jiggly butts. Big butts, little butts, 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 we're the five ladies and we're here to say, please don't break your wind away. Well, the hoy matey. Bow wow. Meow meow. Bow wow wow. Meow meow meow. A dog and a cat in love. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> <laughs> I, I love that pig. Oh, Talk to the lobster. I can't even look at it. I'd be like, oh! <laughs> oh That's all I'm works. asking. Go ahead, ask You're asking, questions. go ahead, ask your question. Oh my God. Here's Jeez. What, here's what I want to do. If I gave you more money, yes. if I gave you 100000 could I get 10%? I'm in. I'd like to do it. If Jim can get there, I'll be there. What do you say, Jim? What say ye? I'm not going to bring Dick all to this thing. <laughs> You know what? I don't bring dick to the table. I bring 333,000 of those little dicks to the table. <laughs> That's what I'm bringing to the table. I'll get that one out of there. I don't bring anything but dick. I don't bring dick. <laughs> no, you, I can't do it. Robert, are you in or out? I'm hoping to be out, Jim. Robert, you're actually not out. You're still in. It's uh, two balls. Come on, Give me all I'll, your money I'll or she's going to get it. <laughs> yeah. Oh! <laughs> we could do a spin-off from the Dragon's Den called the Cougar's Den. The oh! oh. Yeah. Woo! 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 That's not an investment yeah, I'm exactly. gonna make. <laughs> <laughs> you can now kiss the right. I have done a lot of things on this show. I am not kissing Kevin. You're gonna have a. <laughs> what a dork. You got a problem. Do <laughs> <New> his head. <laughs> Whoa! Wow, Zell, so you want to keep your weenie away from that. <laughs> you just walk around. Thank Use the pose. Awesome. Stay actually a little bit more beside you. The guys are all following me. It's this really great. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love to go a dorking. Wherever I go, they call oh. me a dork. Ooh. And it can be a fair. Oh, 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 I'll save you. I'll save you. <laughs> I don't know what it is you're selling, but I like it. Go over there. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so I. Uh, hey, thank you very much, but I'm probably not needed here thank anymore. Thank you very much. We're for all your time. out. Oh, Arlene looks like a wet rat. Okay. Oh my God. Oh, and the juices challenge is on its way. Both cans are open. <laughs> wow. Oh. You got. Oh my goodness. <laughs> here. Perfect. 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 Hey, where do you go? I'm a dork. Or, hey, I think Kevin, I'm... I have some advice for you. Yes. Give me this. <laughs> Give Go sit dog. down. <laughs> Some people say you can't come back after being torn apart by a dragon's attack. The whole thing is, let's get naked. Just kidding. Oh, come oh, I'm sorry, on, Arlene. Though. Robert, Kevin, Jim, and Arlene. And I wasn't here. My I name's know. Bruce. Welcome, Bruce. Good to meet Welcome, you. Welcome, Bruce. Just give us your wallets and we'll triple that green. Three, Three two, two, one. one. Go. Go. A second oh, yeah. chance. <laughs> Unbelievable. Like, this is a real deal. Love you guys. Love you guys. This is fantastic. I'll put my offer. If whoever wants to come in, great. If not, I'll do it on my own. I'll give you your 500K for 50%. We're going to be partners, okay? I'll do the 50,000 for 40%. I would do 200 for 25%. I'm only giving you 40% in order to compete with them. Sure. I'm going to make you an offer of $50,000. For 75%. The offer I'd be prepared to make would be to give you your 125K. I'm gonna need 40% of the company. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you really undercut these two. They're, they're full of shit, okay? I know you guys like to have fun. I really do. Sure. But I want to make you some money. Hey. Ex-member of the Royal Canadian Mount Bruce. Thank you. It's an escort out. It is your bout. Come on, Jared. Let's get our revenge. See you. See you in the third chat. I think Jim should do that more often. God, we have to bring in the heavies.
Oh, that's good. That's Time good. to go. <laughs> You know what I like about Dragon's Den? I, I think it gives a really good snapshot of what makes us Canadians. It's, it's, it's a cut right across the social strata. Every province, everybody's represented from every strata of society, and yet for some reason, the dream is the same. It doesn't matter how rich or poor you are, being an entrepreneur is something everybody pursues. So what, we wanna, what we're gonna do now <clears throat> is get together with Diane, who I've worked with for many years now, and talk a little bit about why this book, why now, and what's in it, and what you might find interesting about the journey that was really taken and then written about. That's what Cold Heart Truth's about. Diane, come on down. Up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Are our mics working now? Hello? Anybody? Yes, okay. Oh, that was fun seeing all those crazy moments again, Kevin. Yes, yeah, sort of off screen at that point. All right, so this is our library interview. Yes. I have to start by asking you, are you aware that people borrow books from libraries for free? How do you make any money doing that? <laughs> this is my question. I'm wondering if you've thought through this That's a very foreign concept. <laughs> All right, so I did read your book just uh, the other day. I quite enjoyed it. You, the way you weave through your life story, your, your personal story with your business lessons, I, I thought it was very readable, really good. Um, I was surprised by some of the stuff that was in there. I didn't, I mean, I feel like I've known you. I've known you for five years, but I mean, I wasn't aware that your parents split up when you were six. Right. You were diagnosed with dyslexia yep. a little bit after that. Your dad died when you were what, eight? Seven. Seven. And your father was only 37. Right, 32 actually. Really? I think so. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, very personal stuff. Did you have any hesitation in deciding to put all this out there to the world in a book? You know, I thought it would be very hard to tell the back end of the story without the front end because everybody has a story. Everybody's made up of their past experiences. And I think some of the motivations that made me what I am today, good, bad, or ugly, came from those early days. And I take dyslexia, for example. Many people are afflicted by this. And I was, you know, falling out of the school system because I couldn't read and I couldn't get any decent math scores at an early age. And so I was very lucky that there was an experimental program in Montreal uh, with a woman named Marjorie Golick that's become legendary around the world now, and Sam Rabinovich, and they basically said, listen, and this I think comes to the core of what motivates me sometimes. They said, you know, yes, you have dyslexia, no question about that, but why don't you think of it as a mutant attribute that's a superpower? Because you're the only guy in your class that can read upside down and in a mirror. <laughs> I thought, hey, that's true. Nobody else can do that. And so it gave me a lot of confidence as they started to say, look, these are things you have that are unique to you. And I often think about that when I'm motivated in, in working, even today. What do I have at my fingertips that maybe my competitor doesn't have, and how can I crush them? That's right. the way I look at it. I'm glad you always bring it around to your gentle side. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, your mother remarried a man who became really influential in your life, and his work meant that you and your brother and your mother ended up going all over the world. Give us the list of all the places you lived in when you were growing up. I first moved to Cambodia, then Tunisia, then Ethiopia, then Cyprus, France, Switzerland, United States, Japan. Every two years we moved. Unbelievable. It was and interesting. You said at the end of the book that sort of going back and revisiting these sort of touch points of your life was both, quote, exhilarating and painful. That's true, because you know it wasn't always easy. If you think about a teenager moving every two years, just when you establish relationships at that crucial time in your life, you're pulled away and to start again. You know what it's like to be a 14-year-old you know, coming to a new school. I was doing that every 24 months. But I think it kind of toughens you up, and it was a very interesting experience, and it's given me a global perspective that's never left me. I mean, I was recently in Cambodia. I'm, in re I'm investing in Cambodian real estate now because I know the country, I know where to invest, I know why it's going to go up in value. And a lot of these places like Tunisia and Ethiopia are very interesting opportunities that most people would avoid because they've never been there. 
I've lived there. So I think it's a huge advantage for me now as a global investor. But I have to say, like one of the parts in the book that I found almost heart-wrenching was when you were 13, living in Cyprus, and you couldn't, that, and of course all these different places Kevin lived in, there was usually like one English school, and that school you had to take a test to get in, and you failed the test. I did. And so your parents made the decision that they would bring you back to Canada, put you in a military college, yeah. like a boarding school, while they went back to Cyprus. So you're 13 years old, and all of a sudden, you're separated from your family. That was very tough, and you know, it also gave me a lot of discipline to get up at 4.30 in the morning and march around in Quebec in February. You know, <laughs> but I came out of there a marksman. I can kill you from 200 yards away. <laughs> Thank you. But you know, I, I think about that experience, and I found out later, two years later, that everybody else who took the test failed it. So the, the test. The, exactly. Yeah. So what they had to do was take a bell curve and pass. I would have passed if I'd written it with everybody else. It was too hard. It was an English school system, O levels, and most of the people there weren't prepared for them, and they all failed. 100%. But you were unfairly separated from it was your too family. Too late. By then, I'd already learned how to shoot 200 yards. <laughs> but you said that experience hardened you in good ways and bad ways. Yeah, definitely. I, it was very isolated, and I, I think that's why I say that if you're going to tell a story about any one individual, you've got to delve into their past. It's almost Freudian. You've got to understand what makes them what they are today. There's always something in their childhood that affected them, positively and negatively. And I think, you know, it, it, when I think about those days, how hard they were, nothing in today's environment that I face is anywhere near as tough as that was. So, you know, when I'm having a bad day, I just have to remember back to Stansted College and say, I can get through this day because that was a lot tougher. Well, by the way, I had no money at that time. Yes, that would have been very hard for you. Worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, to take that point of like where you've been and what it turns you into, I mean, you know, you say in your book, you have this reputation of being the mean one. You know, I talked about you being harsh. You're always, you know, talking about whacking people and so forth. I mean, what was it in your background that, that made you like that? You know, I'm not the mean one. I think what my background gave me was the ability to tell the truth. And I think that if you tell the truth all the time, you never have to remember what you said. But there's something very particular about business and money and investing that's unique to speaking the truth. Because think about it this way. There's nothing else in life like money. You either make it or you lose it. It's so binary. It's very black and white. And so when you see somebody with an idea that obviously is flawed, and they're spending all of their family's capital, they're mortgaging their house, and they're you know, trying to make this thing work after five years, and the, the product itself is screaming at them saying, I'm a dog, kill me. Mm -hmm. I mean, and they don't see it. I think it's time to tell them the truth. And if, I, you know, yeah, but Kevin, you can tell the truth in a gentle and soft way, as some of the dragons do some of the time. But you, generally speaking, are, are pretty cut and dried about it. I think it's important to deliver the message and make it factual and correct. You know, when I hear somebody say, look, you shouldn't be discouraged by the fact you've completely wiped out your family's net worth <laughs> and you've mortgaged your house and your grandmother's going to freeze on the street this winter, you just keep going. That just drives me crazy. I mean, really what you should be saying is, look, you idiot. At, at the end of the day, it's not going to work, so try something else. What's wrong with that message? I have no problem saying it. I don't think there's any room for emotion when it comes to investing, and I don't have any. So I keep the emotional aspect out of it, and I deliver the truth. Frankly, I'm not trying to make friends, Diane, when I'm investing. I have plenty of friends. I'm trying to make money. You want, you want a friend? Buy a dog. 